Good morning. Good to have all of you here this morning. Um, <clears throat> continuation of the Board of Governors meeting of uh, May 19th and uh, May 20th. And I'd like to just open up by uh, introducing Arnoldo Avalos, who wasn't able to join us yesterday, but he is able to join us here this morning. Uh, Member Avalos, would you like to say maybe just a couple of words? Little, sure. little. Just it's it's working. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for having me as part of the board. I'm really um, excited to be here. It's a great day to uh, help uh, be a part of the educational system. One of the things that I feel truly uh, blessed is, you know, having the opportunity to be here in the state of California and attend University of California. Um, I think that, to me, was the biggest equalizer in my life. And so uh, education's key to me, and that's why I want to make sure I serve this board to the best of my abilities. Thank, Thank you. you. It's, good, it's good to have you here, and, and you and the other members will be able to add a little bit more uh, later on in the meeting, so uh, we'll, we'll get to that later on. But uh, as we normally do on many Tuesday mornings, we all have a, an award that, uh, uh, that we hand out for exemplary work, and with that, uh, we'll go out on to um, item 5.1, and Executive Vice Chancellor Eric uh, Skinner will uh, introduce the uh, agenda item. All right. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So th this uh, item this morning is, a, uh, as President Bach indicated, an awards ceremony for uh, uh, classified employees. And I, I think that uh, um, member uh, Danny Hawkins is going to take the, take the lead on this. And uh, President Keith o. Smith from the foundation is also going to step forward and kind of st step us through introducing us to the award winners and uh, making the presentations. So please come forward. Thank you, President Baca, uh, Executive uh, Vice Chancellor Skinner. Thank you all for being here. The sixth annual Classified Employees of the Year Award for the Community College System granted by the Board of Governors. It is an auspicious week. This is Classified School Employees Week. The st state of California has designated the third week in May to recognize the hard work and the uh, you know countless hours of, of uh, life that our, our classified professionals bring to the community college system in, in supporting our students and rendering su their success. So I'd like to give all classified employees a round of applause, please. <laughs> we have four winners with us today, and uh, they are in alphabetical order in case anybody was wondering. And the first recipient, as you make your way down, please do so, is Katie Fitzgerald from uh, uh, Mission College in Santa Clara. Katie is, is a student enrollment and financial services recruitment supervisor at Mission College and has been with the district for over eight years. Katie embodies the California Community College and has the... Uh, here we go. The, uh, through her advocacy and support of students, especially the work uh, with considered at-risk students. Katie, congratulations. Please accept your award. say thank you. I am very honored to be receiving this award and um, as much as I am kind of numb from the occasion I still feel very honored but at the same time I'm like what I, I was just doing my job so um, though I really do appreciate their recognition and um, I know I work hard as do my colleagues so thank you so much for this honor. Our
Our next recipient is Michael Mitchell from San Mateo Community College District and the College of San Mateo. He's been with their di uh, the district for 24 years and uh, works in the Student Services Division and uh, coordinating and developing, implementing, and evaluating student services in their pursuits of certificates, associate degrees, and transfer. Michael, congratulations. Please accept our award. Again, I want to thank the board for uh, nominating me, and I also want to thank my colleagues from the San Mateo County Community College District who are here today. Really appreciate their support. I work with a great group of colleagues and, and professionals, and just want to leave you with this. One of the things I always get asked is, what is my favorite, favorite part about my job in transfer services? And it's a lot of things, and I really do enjoy where I work. And my favorite part is this time of year, where students get accepted into their universities and come in with a smile on their face, a tear in their eye, and I feel as if I, if I could just be a small part of that, then hopefully I've done my job in their lives, or a small part in their lives. Thank you very much again. Our next recipient is Brooke Sauter from South Orange Community College District. Brooke is a senior administrative assistant in the transfer career and special programs division at Saddleback College. During her 10 years in the district, Brooke has proven herself to be knowledgeable, compassionate, and uh, a welcoming face on campus. Congratulations, Brooke. to everyone I just want to say thank you I just feel like I'm doing my job every day and I'm lucky and honored to get to work with the students and the student veterans every day and I come from a fabulous college and district where the classified staff are all worthy of this award and it's great to just work with great people every day so thank you so much Our last recipient, by no means least, is Hoover Zariani. Hoover, please come on down. He's from Glendale Community College District. He is a senior coordinator in the student, student services program with 24 years in his district. Hoover, congratulations on this well-deserved award. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Vayar, our Board of Trustees, and uh, Saudat Azizhanova, who's our CSEA President, for this nomination. Uh, and you, of course. Uh, it's very humbling. I appreciate it very much. And actually, I have to get back to work to organizing the Classified Employees Week uh, <laughs> back on campus. So thank you so much. It, it's really a great honor. And I just hope that I've worked at Glendale for 24 years, and I've learned every day from students, so I hope that continues for a long time to come. So thank you. Thank you. May I have the winners please come back? There's going to be a group picture with the Board of Governors, please.
And on a personal uh, privilege, we are uh, really uh, honored to have with us our uh, person who made the uh, Community College Classified Award System uh, what it is today. So would Tana Thomas please come forward to be recognized? I know. Surprise, surprise, Tana. Thank you for being here, my dear friend. And we have a, a small uh, token for you. Injury? Thank you. Well, this is a bit of a surprise, and usually I'm not speechless, but um, at this point I probably am. I can tell you that I am absolutely thrilled to see this program continue and hopefully continue to flourish. I was having a conversation with the college president and a, and a president of the Board of Trustees here in the room, and, and I said that it's so important to recognize all parties and all constituent groups that are a part of student success. And so I really, really hope that this process will continue into the next year and as you go back to your colleges that you encourage people to nominate, to recognize one another and to put, put the best face forward that we have within our system. Thank you. Thank you, Tana. I just want to say, anybody who's had an opportunity to serve with Tana uh, on the Board of Governors knows what an inspiring and, uh, and compassionate and wonderful person she is. And uh, I'm glad that we, Danny, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to recognize Tana and, and uh, her leadership uh, for classified and advocacy for classified employees. <coughs> Indeed. Thank you both very much for that. And thank you, Vice President Baum, for uh, mentioning that. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, uh, two members of uh, Governor Brown's uh, uh, staff here with us this morning. Sonia Ustis, who's uh, Deputy Appointment Secretary. Sonia, if we could. Good morning. <laughs> And we also have Jason McConnell, uh, also with the Governor's Office uh, Education Advisor. Thank, thank you both for, very much for being here this morning. Uh, we will now uh, move on to uh, item 5.2, an update on the Governor's 2014-2015 uh, uh, May re revision budget proposal. Uh, Executive Vice Chancellor uh, Skinner, turn that over to you. All right. Yes. Uh, <coughs> This next item is is an update on the on the uh, the state budget process and the at this particular juncture in that process the the May revision uh, is in the spotlight. This is the governor's opportunity to to update his January budget plan, and uh, that uh, that May revision proposal was was, uh, 
released last week, and it's the topic of discussions in the Capitol right now. And so, uh, Vice Chancellor Dan Troy, our uh, Vice Chancellor for Fiscal Policy, and our key budget advocate over in the Capitol, has been in the middle of the mix, uh, and so he's back here to report the latest developments. Uh, yes, thank you, Deputy Chancellor Skinner, President Baca, members of the board. Uh, hopefully, you have this uh, late-breaking uh, handout that I uh, we put on your uh, at, at your uh, desk uh, just this morning. Uh, since the May revision came out last week, we could not do an update in time for the, uh, the to be printed in the board agenda. So here's your item today that will we'll, uh, we'll discuss what the what was in the governor's May revise and talk a little bit about uh, what happens uh, after that. So uh, as when the as people watch the cash. Uh, flowing into the state treasury uh, this year, everybody likes to watch those those daily uh, trackers from the, the the controller's office and the LAO. Uh, the, we could see that the dollars coming in in the current year were higher than what was estimated uh, by the governor in the budget. So that led to hopes, of course, that uh, not only would we see a cash infusion uh, in the current year and get some additional one-time uh, resources, but uh, the hope was that the governor would also see that that increase in the current year revenue would flow into the budget year, and that we would get uh, uh, an even better, uh, op more in, an op a picture of the January, uh, the 14-15 year that was even more optimistic than the already quite good uh, proposal we received uh, in January. Uh, what the governor's and his team saw was a was a bit more complicated uh, than that. Uh, his view on the current year resources is that it's mostly one time in nature. Uh, and if anything, uh, the budget year is uh, proposal for us is a little less robust than what we had in January. Uh, part of that is because if the uh, the way the Proposition 98 guarantee works, it's really based largely on year over year percentage change. So if the current year goes up strongly and the budget year doesn't go up much, then that current year percentage is actually somewhat negative. So uh, that is driving, uh, in the governor's view, the guarantee down slightly in the 14-15 year. Uh, however, it's still a, a very robust uh, package for community colleges, particularly in light of the uh, harsh uh, reductions we received during the, uh, uh, the economic downturn. So uh, some of the key changes that the governor proposes for the 14-15 uh, year are outlined in the handout I have. I think particularly if we start on uh, page two of the handout, we can walk through some of that. Uh, the governor does create room, despite the down, uh, the slight decrease in the um, uh, in the budget year Prop 90 guarantee. The governor is able to create a little bit of new room for program that year by shifting some of the deferral payments instead of, uh, from the budget year to the current year. So he's using the increase in the current year amount to fund more of the deferral buy down in that year. That creates a little space in the budget year for a little bit more program. What the governor chooses to do with that is to add $50 million to the Economic Workforce Development Program, uh, on a, he says on a one-time basis, to improve student success in career technical education. So uh, essentially what this is attempting to do is take advantage of the good work that uh, our, our office under uh, Vice Chancellor Von Tan, Quinn Levon's leadership, uh, has done with the regional uh, networks to um, uh, really emphasize doing what matters and get districts and regions to uh, align their course offerings to uh, regional labor markets. Uh, so by giving uh, an augmentation uh, in this item, I think the hope is that uh, they can take that next step and make that investment toward uh, uh, tailoring their programs and offering toward those, uh, toward those uh, regional uh, agreements that they've come to. So we're uh, enthusiastic about this, uh, this proposal. Uh, some of the other dollars are fairly technical. Uh, the estimates for property taxes and fees uh, have decreased somewhat since the January budget, so more general fund is required to fully fund our apportionment. So we're appreciative of the governor uh, filling that hole so that we're not left short uh, in the apportionment. Uh, there's also $6 million proposed to increase technology infrastructure with the purpose of this being to uh, increase the reliability of backup internet connectivity for districts uh, and also to upgrade their equipment, routers and uh, such. Uh, so that um, uh, districts have a reliable internet connection. That is, of course, increasingly important for districts uh, as we move forward on uh, distance education, uh, the online education initiative, e-transcripts, things like that. Having that reliable connection is increasingly important for, uh, for colleges. Uh, 
The governor does uh, update the COLA somewhat. It was already a fairly low COLA. That's a statutory calculation. It was a 0 0.86 in January. It's come down to 0.85% right now, so uh, a very small COLA, particularly in light of uh, the five years of uh, where the colleges did not receive a COLA at all. Uh, the governor drops his proposal for increased access from 3% to 2.75%. So still a very robust uh, uh, number to increase uh, access for the system. Uh, the governor makes a, a change to his deferred maintenance of instructional equipment uh, proposal. In January, he had proposed $175 million for that purpose. Uh, split evenly between deferred maintenance and instructional equipment. In this update, we're down to 148 million, and he now proposes that it all go toward deferred maintenance. Uh, significantly, he also um, eliminates the need for a local match for those uh, for, for those dollars, and that is something that our system has advocated for. So we're very appreciative of him listening to us on that. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, districts are squeezed for discretionary dollars right now after years of budget cuts and a low cola. So uh, getting rid of that local match should help make sure that all districts can uh, have a little flexibility <coughs> in their budgets and, and uh, make sure that nobody's turning dollars away provided in the budget. Uh, there's a minor change to the Proposition 39 funds that just has to do with the, the revenues that are coming in through the, uh, the uh, Clean Energy and Jobs Creation Act. So it's, that's just a technical adjustment that goes down uh, from 39 million to about 37 and a half million. Uh, another major uh, policy adjustment that the governor is supporting at this time to be implemented in the 15-16 year, so there's no funding implications this year, there's a year of planning uh, until that would be implemented, is to increase the funding rate for our CDCP uh, uh, rate from uh, about 3,300 up to about, up to the uh, credit rate, which is about $4,700. That, so again, that would be effective in the 15-16 year, and we estimate that's about a, a cost of about $50 million. Uh, for districts. We, we think that's a very strong proposal. Uh, number one, there's never really been any good uh, reason to think that those students participating in those programs <coughs> require less resources than the students in credit programs. And we also think that that'll help. Uh, oh, sorry. So it is non-credit. Yeah, it's enhanced non-credit. Yeah, the um, acronym was CDCP, which is Career Development College Preparation. And it's an also <coughs> called enhanced non-credit. Yeah, it's, it's career development track, so it does have a C CTE link. And I think part of the rationale for doing this is that it, uh, uh, it will eliminate a disincentive to offer uh, career tech work to those on, on a non-credit track. Right. So we're, we're supportive of the change, and there's colleges would have a year now to uh, prepare their programs, so we think that's, uh, that's wise as well. Uh, uh, the g the governor, the governor continues, what we saw last year, what we're seeing is a very similar situation to what we saw last year. We had an increase in the current year funding. People had their hopes up that the budget year would, would see a similar increase. The governor said, not so fast. Uh, I'm not seeing that same picture you are. The LAO came out with their estimates a couple days later and said, well, we do see a whole lot of extra money here. Actually, that current year increase does continue. Um, and uh, at the, in the final analysis in the 13-14 budget, uh, they came down in alignment with the governor's funding. What are we seeing this year? Same exact thing. Three days after the governor released his figures, the LEO's numbers came out and they said, actually, we see lots of extra money. They see about two and a half billion extra dollars than what is in the governor's budget. If you roll that through the guarantee, the impact of that for the community colleges would be almost another $250 million in program available for the budget year. Uh, I, my understanding in talking with the committee staff is that they intend, they like the LAO numbers better than the governor's number, more is better. Uh, so that's, that's a, a clear, uh, 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 clear judgment on their part that more is better. So I think what we're gonna see this week is that as the budget subcommittees meet and craft their own version of the budget, they are gonna augment Prop 98 spending considerably. Uh, now, that does not mean that we're gonna, that those numbers will stick for the final agreement. As I recall, they did not last year. Uh, but what it may do is uh, <coughs> signal to the, to the governor and to the advocates uh, in Prop 98 what their priorities are, uh, how they differ from the governor, and that can set up negotiations as we get to the final budget. They were able to do, uh, the legislature was able to um, promote some funding, additional funding for categorical programs in last year's budget, and that, that came down as part of the final agreement. And I wouldn't be surprised if they, uh, tried, they 
a similar uh, action happens this year. Uh, you know, the governor has made his, uh, his fiscal prudence pretty clear, not only in his uh, revenue estimates, but uh, in his calls to address the CalSTRS uh, funding uh, liability. Uh, we certainly knew that this is an issue that's been a problem for a long time. We have an outstanding uh, unfunded liability of $74 uh, billion uh, in the STRS fund. Uh, there has been a lot of talk throughout the year of coming up with an agreement that would be uh, start to be implemented in the 15-16 year, so we did not expect any action in the 14-15 year. Uh, but the governor uh, saw an opportunity now, a push within the legislature to get, uh, get a grip on the program and decided to try to do something in the 14-15 program, 14-15 uh, budget. So uh, under his proposal, uh, employer contribution rates would go up about 1.25% uh, in the budget year, so as of July 1. So that obviously creates uh, new funding obligations for districts that they had not been uh, anticipating. Uh, the uh, statewide uh, estimate for that increased cost uh, is $28 million. Uh, and to put that in some perspective, we're, we're estimating the COLA increase to be only $47 million. So this uh, is more or less eliminates 60% of the COLA uh, that districts would receive in the 14-15 year. Uh, that, that those contributions would increase rapidly uh, in the subsequent years, uh, another 1.6% a year until 2021 when the rate would be 19.1%. So again, in a sh short period of time, about seven years, the employer contribution rate would go from 8% to 19.1. Uh, when fully implemented, and you consider the impact of growth in COLA over those next several years, we could be looking at uh, increased funding annual obligations for districts of about $300 million. So obviously, that, that's, that's uh, equivalent to adding, a, say, a major categorical program to our system. Uh, so we're, um, while we see the need to uh, get out in front and address this issue, we don't quibble with that. Uh, we do think that our budget needs to be crafted in a way that allows colleges an opportunity to <coughs> support that increased cost. Uh, so we'll be working with the, the legislature and the governor on that uh, proposal and over the next few weeks and probably over the next few years. Uh, the governor and the legislature also came to agreement on putting a uh, modification to the state's rainy day fund uh, on the ballot this November. Uh, it was a, the, the, it's rare to see unanimous agreement in the legislature these days, but this year uh, we had it on that. So uh, we think this is a good way to um, <coughs> smooth out the boom and bust cycles that the state has gone through uh, time and time again, uh, driven largely by the volatility of capital gains uh, tax returns. So if approved by the voters this November, what would happen is that 1.5% of general fund revenues would go into a uh, revised budget stabilization account uh, until that account had an amount up, up to 10% of state general fund uh, revenues in it. Uh, also notable is in the first 15 years of that agreement, it would, it would take effect in the 15, 16 year, uh, is that half of that money, so half of that 1.5% would go to paying off s existing state obligations such as uh, uh, pension obligations of the state, uh, uh, school debt, such as uh, prior mandate claims, uh, things like that. Uh, and also significant uh, adjustment to that is uh, a creation of a Proposition 98 reserve. <coughs> so what this would do is in years in which those capital gains tax ret returns were very high, were 8% or more of the state's general fund revenue, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and assuming that all current obligations for the 98 guarantee are met, so there's no maintenance factor, growth in coal is funded, et cetera. So basic needs of the, of the K-14 world would be met in the existing budget. It would peel off those revenues into that reserve so that in um, down years for the guarantee and negative years for the guarantee, that, that reserve would be available to fund growth in COLA for K-14 education. So obviously the goal is to smooth out that boom and bust cycle that is so uh, uh, pervasive in our world. So uh, once again, uh, I expect the, uh, the legislative subcommittees to meet this week. Uh, I expect that they will augment uh, our budget considerably over that time. Uh, that's not, I, I'll certainly deliver that news to you uh, when it comes probably later this week. We'll have, a, they'll have, their, have made their final uh, decisions. I'll uh, try to update the board on that as soon as I have that information available to you. 
Uh, again, that is not the final point of the process. The two will come together in a legislative conference committee, probably starting in early June, uh, and they will hammer out a final budget agreement uh, with the governor uh, in that time. So with that, uh, I will uh, pause there and uh, give you opportunity to ask uh, any questions you might uh, have of me. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Troy. B before we go to questions, uh, Executive Vice Chancellor Skinner. Thank you. I, I just had one uh, point. At, you know, I, there was a comprehensive update, and but by its nature, the budget process we're always focused on kind of the the, the new proposal that's on the table. But just uh, as a refresher, the many features of the governor's proposal, the core proposal from January, have remained in t intact, and in fact, have received fairly wide support in the legislature. I don't think there's any reason to think that they won't be in the final budget. And some of those key features are the you know, the $100 million augmentation to the Student Success and Support Program, the $100 million for equity plans to allow colleges to close, uh, work to close equity gaps, achievement gaps with uh, student populations, and um, and then the access funding, you know, the a clear signal to the, the colleges that it's that it's time to open the doors, you know, a clear signal to Californians that they're, that they're gonna be seats for you again at the community colleges, so come forward. So those those key features of, of access and success are we're in the in that January budget and uh, align very well with with the, the board's uh, student success agenda and uh, uh, again those those core features remain intact in this proposal yeah that that's right and again I don't see any uh, reason to think that uh, that will change much uh, in the final deal I think there'll be a very healthy number for access in the budget I think we'll see a, a very healthy increases for the student success and support program uh, and I think we'll see a significant uh, contribution to that to the student equity plan funding proposal to the exact dollars of, you know they, that, that could change a little bit as we get to the, the, the final agreement that's possible but uh, again I think we're going to see all those items stick uh, at, at some very robust level certainly the the system is of course very appreciative of the governor's uh, focus in on community colleges and the support that we're receiving in his budget uh, we recognize that there continues to be some issues in terms of structure and uh, the liabilities there. Uh, but uh, in terms of what uh, Executive Vice Chancellor uh, Skinner just pointed out, uh, I think that uh, the governor's uh, uh, budget proposal clearly is, is directed at areas where we have been working on for the last several years as a board and as, as a system. Um, with that, I will open it up for any questions you might have, uh, Member Estolano. Yeah, just uh, one question on the $50 million that's being proposed to be added to economic and workforce development. I know it's hard to read the tea leaves of the legislature, but is there any reason to, to think that there wouldn't be support for that in the budget committee? Uh, no, I, I, think there's, I think they're supportive of it. Uh, again, I think when we get to a final agreement, if, we're, if uh, the agreement comes back down to the governor's level of funding, uh, you know, could that 50 become 35 as they try to seek uh, uh, support for other uh, categorical programs of interest I think that's possible but I, I think uh, particularly the assembly has been very supportive of funding for CTE so I think some of that money will stick yeah I know we're gonna have our legislative report next I think and there was just quite a number of bills looking at CTE and workforce development so it seemed like it's a positive movement for those programs agreed yeah. Mallie, um, <clears throat> on the state's rainy day fund mm -hmm. they're going to have the goal of 10 percent stored for the future That's right. so with our proposition 98 reserve do they have a goal of what amount they are heading for uh, no I don't think in the agreement there's any limit to what would go into the reserve uh, it's uh, but uh, I, I think it's we sh I do want to reiterate that there are a number of conditions being put into the agreement uh, for those years in which dollars would be shifted out of a guarantee into the reserve so I think it would only be in very, very good, very healthy Proposition 98 years would we see any diversion of funds into that reserve account. Uh, again, the maintenance factor would all have to be paid down. It would have to be uh, what they call a test one year. Uh, growth <coughs> cola obligations would already have to be paid. So uh, I think it's very unlikely that it would be uh, uh, very harmful to us uh, that uh, that dollars would be pushed into the reserve. Okay, thank you. Vice President Baum. I'm very grateful to see the governor's attacking the CalSTRS um, uh, long-term deficit. I did notice through your report that 70% of that will be uh, is projected or proposed to <coughs> be absorbed by local districts, and and so 
I, I just, w that'll be something we're going to have to watch carefully because that would be a significant impact to local district budgets. Uh, and things have been good, but uh, but if 70 percent, that's a huge obligation that, uh, that I don't know, uh, have there been conversations how local districts would make up for that uh, obligation? Well, uh, certainly this is an issue I've heard a lot about from our chief business officials mm -hmm. and CEOs. They're very concerned about that obligation going forward. And again, just as you say, I, I, I think, uh, I don't think anyone would quibble that we need to do something. And, this, and that will require shared pain from uh, employees, employers, and the state general fund will also be kicking in uh, a significant uh, increase in their contribution as well. So, uh, you know, you could quibble over what's the right percentage here or there or how quickly to phase it in. Uh, but w primarily what we've been asking for is that whatever the final agreement is, that we revisit our budget and make sure that we have some uh, capability of meeting that obligation, whether it's a set aside in the budget for increased contributions, uh, perhaps it's an, an adjustment to the COLA uh, to recognize that districts are going to need uh, uh, increased discretionary resources to make that payment. Um, but it, we need we need, the, the, we we have to be aware of the reality. We can't have we can't have a Calsters uh, agreement and a community college budget that isn't right. linked together. Okay. The other uh, thing is just I'm looking ahead a few years from now when Prop 30 sunsets in. When will we start projecting in, in the assumption maybe that there's another measure to extend it? Because one of the reasons we're in such strong shape today is because of Prop 30. Or how do we prepare the system for a fact that uh, Prop 30 may not uh, uh, continue on after a couple of years from now? Yeah, that's right. The, um, let's see, the sales tax portion of it ends at the end of 2016. Uh, so in the 16-17 in the year, you'll begin to see some uh, diminution of that of those revenues from Prop 30, and the income tax portion ends a couple of years later. The income tax portion is probably 70 percent of the revenue, so that's when we'll see the really the bigger impact is uh, is uh, down the road in the 1819 uh, fiscal year. Uh, so yes, th we've been we've been very clear, I think, with districts that these taxes are temporary, and that as they augment their budgets and higher, they should probably be very aware that uh, as as time goes on. Uh, they may have less uh, resources available to sustain uh, increases that they've implemented in the, in the, subs in the preceding years. Uh, that said, uh, th right now the long-range projections, and you know, take long-range pre progressions with a healthy do dose of salt, uh, don't look very poor poorly at those years. There's enough growth uh, in those years so that's such that, the, that there won't be a dramatic shelf in the decline in the guarantee. Uh, now again, that, that certainly can change over time, uh, but um, uh, I do agree that districts need to be very right. careful about how they augment their budget. Because that's what we've found that a lot of districts get themselves in precarious financial situations because they make long-range obligations on not long necessarily term guaranteed funding. And, mm -hmm. and that. That's right. Uh, my last question, I don't know if it's for Vince, is that uh, I'd heard that the, le uh, the Senate is looking at um, how to fund pre-K services and that, uh, and, and there's been some talk that perhaps Prop 98 could be a source of funding for that. Is that something we should be uh, mindful of? Uh, it's something I've certainly been wary of, because uh, one way to go to fund that would be uh, to visit, revisit the split between uh, K-12 and community colleges. Uh, the good news is that the governor has been very, very strong on funding the uh, community college split. So I think if they, whatever agreement they come to, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the pre-K program, assuming the governor goes along with it at all. Uh, hopefully it won't impact our share of the guarantee. Okay. Not to say we, we don't, we'd love to see pre-K funded as yeah. well. We just uh, want right. to be mindful of that. Uh, I do want to, one, one further comment on uh, Prop 30 is that uh, I think while the governor has been uh, uh, reticent to support extending uh, those, uh, those taxes, uh, I would not be surprised if others did not put uh, attempt to extend them on the ballot. So uh, it may be that uh, those revenues will continue. Any other questions? Uh, Member Van Miller. Under deferred maintenance and instructional, uh, instructional equipment, you stated that all $148 million um, was scheduled to go towards deferred maintenance only. What is the rationale behind that, as opposed to a balance between deferred maintenance and instructional equipment? Yeah, well, traditionally when that item has been funded, it's, uh, it's, it's been a split 
along those lines. Uh, we've seen very little funding uh, for that uh, since the, uh, the budget downturn in 2007-8. So the governor's proposal in January uh, kind of reflected that uh, traditional split. Uh, the leg legislative analyst's office made a point uh, in hearings and in the write-ups to say that, well, we have uh, what, you know, what is the existing rationale to keep uh, that up. We have a lot of data in our office on capital outlay needs for, I think, for very clear reasons. We, we, we need to track that to, uh, to handle state allocation bonds, et cetera. So we, we, we collect a lot of information in our office on facility and capital needs. Uh, we don't collect as much money on instructional equipment uh, expenditures. So the LAO's point was that, well, uh, we've got evidence here, we don't have evidence there. Uh, you know, what's, what's the rationale for giving it out for instructional equipment? Uh, we would actually support um, either going back to the original split uh, between the item or um, allowing districts the flexibility to choose. I think that would be a, a, a beneficial to the districts to have that option. Very good. Any other questions? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Vice Chairman. Thank you. We will now uh, move on to uh, item 5.3, state and federal legislative update. Uh, Executive Vice Chancellor uh, Skinner. This next item is uh, <coughs> an update from Vice Chancellor for Governmental Relations, Vincent Stewart. And uh, it is definitely the time of year when the, the legislative process is heating up. There are a lot of bills that are uh, that are moving forward and uh, debates and negotiations happening on uh, many more and uh, Vince is our man in the capital on those issues and he's here to provide you with an update. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, President Baca, members of the board, Deputy Chancellor Skinner. Certainly my pr uh, pleasure to uh, present to you this morning. Would also like to welcome the new members of the board. It's a pleasure to be with you as well. Um, before getting into uh, some of the bills that are outlined in your board packet, I did want to start off by pointing out the posters to, uh, to my right here, and I know that Chancellor Harris mentioned these yesterday. These were part of the Joint Higher Education Advocacy Day that we did with the UC and the CSU on April 29th, and these were displayed outside of the governor's office along with three panels recognizing CSU students and three panels recognizing UC students. And as I'm sure some of the members of the board are aware, we have done these joint advocacy events in the past. This year it was slightly different. Uh, we tried a model of bringing in uh, CEOs from our system and college chancellors and presidents from the UC and the CSU system to uh, convene advocacy teams and, <coughs> excuse me, and meet with their regional legislators. Uh, I think it was a successful model, but we will certainly be uh, taking a look at that and seeing how it compares to models we've used in the past where we've employed students and members of the board and local trustees and to kind of see what's the right mixture in terms of carrying um, a shared and collective message between the three, three systems of public higher education. Um, I would also like to recognize the tremendous support coming out of our communications division as well as the foundation for helping to support and underwrite those efforts, so uh, definitely a team effort. Um, transitioning now to uh, legislation, and I'll start first with uh, state legislation. I know that in your packets there are summaries of several bills. Uh, my intent was not to go through each of those. I'm certainly happy to, to address any questions that you might have about any of those bills. But I thought I would first start by summarizing the sponsored legislation that we have this year and then pausing for a few questions and then getting into some of the higher profile bills um, around things like the baccalaureate degree around adult education, and then there's a series of bills dealing with accreditation issues. So, um, and, and I will say this, given that we do have several new members of the board, I'll probably go into a little more background and context for them to kind of bring them to where we are right now. So uh, this year we actually have three sponsored bills, um, and these uh, bills were part of a process, a, a fairly involved uh, process that we go through in terms of identifying issues that require legislation that started back in September of last year uh, through our, our consulta consultation council process, which involves um, consultation with faculty, with classified staff, with external and internal stakeholders to identify issues that we feel need a, a, a legislative fix. So moving through that process, uh, we identified three bills that we thought were worth uh, sponsorship, brought that to the board in November. Uh, the board approved uh, that, uh, that package of uh, legislation and we are now uh, in, I would say, the, 
I don't want to say the midpoint, but we're getting close to the midpoint of having those bills move through their first house and hopefully on to the second house. So uh, the first bill is uh, Assembly Bill 1451. This is authored by Assemblymember uh, Chris Holden from the Pasadena area. It addresses the notion of concurrent enrollment. Uh, and this is where we have high school students who are concurrently enrolled in their high schools as well as taking community college courses. There are several models around the state where this occurs. Uh, some of the more notable models are uh, middle college high schools, which are high schools that are autonomous high schools located on community college campuses and generally targeting and serving underserved uh, populations of students. Um, and those are, uh, I think, uh, through recent evaluations and research have demonstrated to be quite effective in bringing up performance at the high school level as well as helping students matriculate and uh, be more successful as they go into community college and post-secondary generally. And there are actually nine of those middle college high schools around the state that are um, supported by our office. They receive a modest level of grant funding. Uh, the other uh, uh, model that is attached to this bill is something called an early college high school. Uh, an early college high school isn't necessarily uh, focused on underserved populations and isn't necessarily or located on a college campus, but is the same type of model as a middle college. Uh, the other thing I should note is in that model, the notion is that as students move through their four years of high school and concurrent enrollment in a community college, that they emerge at the end of that four years with a high school diploma and either an associate's degree or a significant number of units to, the, to where they're very, very close to, to an associate's degree. And, and then the third model that would be a part of this legislation, assuming it moves forward, is the notion of creating partnerships at the district level uh, between the community college district and local school districts. And, and the idea here is to have the chancellor of the district along with the superintendent of the school district really articulate and put into writing a formal partnership in terms of how uh, they want to deliver concurrent enrollment for those students. I think historically in the past, concurrent enrollment has been something that has been um, more an option for your higher achieving students who want to accumulate some college credits before they move on into post-secondary or they're taking an AP course or something along those lines. The idea here was to not necessarily stop doing that, but to create a model of concurrent enrollment that's more developed around pathways. So students are taking articulated courses, particularly around the notion of career technical education. So as students t do more of that, and, and we're seeing higher levels of partnership between K-12 and community colleges, a lot of that being driven by the work of, of uh, Vice Chancellor Vontan Quivlin and the Doing What Matters work but the idea is really to create stronger partnerships so as those students emerge out of high school within career te technical partnerships that they have um, a, a really good handoff into the community college and, and, and really trying to make that more successful both for them and the, and the institutions. Uh, the other pathway that is a focus of that partnership would be preparing students for transfer. And I think really what's underlying all of this is how do we get students coming out of high school who are both college and career ready. Um, and, and I think that's important for several reasons. One is we want to see students perform better at the high school level so that they are graduating high school. But equally important is that when they enter post-secondary education that they're ready to do college level work. And I think that's important for us because as we're dealing with a significant issue around remediation and, and the cost both to the institution and to the students, Having students come to our doors ready to do college level work and avoid, avoid getting into the churn of basic skills I think is tremendously, tremendously important and effective. So this, uh, this particular bill um, was double referred to both the Assembly Education Committee and the Assembly Higher Education Committee because it touches both high schools and community colleges. It's currently in the Appropriations Committee in the Assembly. It's undergone a fair amount of amendments to deal with some rather technical issues around where classes can be offered, um, what are the requirements of instructors who are teaching courses, ensuring that college faculty who might be teaching at a high school have background checks, uh, but also making um, some additional flexibility with the program, allowing students to take a few more units at the college level so it helps them get closer to that associate's degree. 
Um, so the idea is, is, is as we can facilitate this, this model and make it a bit easier to implement, uh, that we will get more students uh, choosing this option. And then in turn for that added flexibility, the colleges and the high schools are required to report more of their data on student performance uh, outcomes and achievement back to the state, both to our office and the Department of Education, so we can better track the effectiveness of these programs. Um, it's by no means a silver bullet, but I think it is you know, one tool in the toolbox of, of, of uh, strategies that we can have to help increase student performance both at the high school and at the community college. So um, we have been, uh, I think, very pleased with the progress of the bill. It has gotten a very favorable analysis out of the Appropriations Committee which historically has not been the case with these types of bills. There's been a lot of talk on both sides that um, when you fund K-12 through their average daily attendance for high school students and you fund our system for community college students, that there is perhaps this notion of, of double dipping, that you're paying for that same student twice and that same instructional activity twice. We've been very careful to distinguish between that and saying that for the college level work that's uh, the, the support goes to the community college for the, for the high school coursework that goes to the high school and there's a clear distinction that we're not going to overlap so uh, we'll certainly keep you posted as that bill moves forward the deadline for the appropriations committee is this Friday um, and we are cautiously optimistic that we will be able to cross that threshold and take it to the assembly floor and then on to the Senate the, um, the next sponsored bill that I'll mention is uh, AB 2558. Uh, this is a bill by Assemblymember Doss Williams, who is the chair of the Assembly Higher Education Committee. Uh, and this is an issue that came out of the work of the Student Success Task Force, as well as um, a committee that was formed following the task force to look at professional development. Uh, we have had a program in statute for several years that focused professional development exclusively on faculty. This is an effort to broaden that and include both administrative and classified staff. And I think this is really out of recognition that through all of the work through the Student Success Task Force uh, initiative, the Student Success Act, that it's important for all of the staff on our colleges to receive the training and acquire the best practices to help our students be successful. And I think we saw a terrific demonstration of that this morning with the awards to classified staff that it is uh, really the entire uh, community at our colleges that, that are working together to help students be successful. This bill doesn't have any uh, cost attached to it right now, so it's already moved over to the Senate. However, we are seeking through the budget process some dedicated funding to ensure that, uh, that this can be, uh, can be a successful program for colleges. And the notion is, is that colleges would have the option of applying for these dollars and then in getting those dollars, they would then be able to spread the pro professional development across uh, the various uh, employee groups. The, um, the third bill that we're sponsoring this year is SB 965 by Senator Leno. And this is uh, legislation that uh, we've had some discussion, uh, I believe, yesterday. Uh, and this would help with the college and really smooth out its decline in funding as a relation to its decline in enrollment. Um, we have been working certainly with Senator Leno, leadership in the legislature, as well as the governor's office to figure out what's the appropriate balance to strike there. But I think it's, it's very clear that that college, given its current situation, needs some additional assist assistance beyond the one year of stabilization funding that colleges are eligible for now. Um, the bill was recently in the Senate uh, Education Committee and underwent some amendments. We had originally asked for four years of stabilization funding. It's now been scaled back to three years with the requirement that uh, 18 months in there would be some additional reporting back to the legislature uh, on the progress being made at the college toward meeting uh, its uh, fiscal and financial goals and ensuring that they are on strong financial footing as well as meeting the requirements of, of their plans around student outcomes and, 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 and the sort. So um, that has certainly been, been a heavy lift as the Chancellor has mentioned previously in terms of the resources and time of this office but we think it's incredibly important and again we're also you know, pursuing efforts on a parallel track with the budget to ensure that the resources are there for uh, SB 965. 
So I'll pause there briefly to see, to see if you have any questions about the sponsored bills for the Board of Governors. I have Mr. one question that had, had uh, percolated in the uh, local level about the uh, fiscal stabilization from San Francisco, and I, I just want to make sure the CEOs and others were supporting that as well, because I had heard at one point business offices were concerned that other districts would be penalized by financial stability being offered to, uh, or they would have to help underwrite that uh, for San Francisco. There is um, definitely a... Uh, um, a difference of opinion across the system, uh, yeah, but I think generally speaking, folks are supportive of what we're trying to accomplish in terms of saving this institution. And we've certainly tried to separate separate out the, the conversation around what's happening at City College of San Francisco and the conversation around stabilization funding generally, which I think is where the other CEOs um, have been. And, and, and I don't mean to over oversimplify, but there has been an ongoing conversation about how do we move from the one year of stabilization that we received now to the three years that we had before? I think that's definitely a conversation that needs to occur. However, in the meantime, you have a crisis at City College of San Francisco that needs to be addressed, and, and we're trying to move forward on that. Uh, you know, is there unanimous agreement around 965? No, there are folks who, who disagree with that approach. Um, but however, we think it is the best approach for this college, I think. That is what we're hearing from legislative leadership. I think that's what we're hearing from the administration and legislative staff. So, yeah, I'm hoping that our colleagues up and down the state realize it's it is yes, it's targeted at San Francisco, but it actually sets up a, 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 would be in their interest to see that uh, the system work to save the institution and uh, and support the legislation as well. But just for a point of clarity, it isn't about additional monies. It's simply maintaining funding. Stabilized. It is. It's to, it's to stabilize that college. So essentially, you know, the, the footprint of that college would remain intact, if you will, mm -hmm. as it tries to build back its enrollment. Um, and I think that's just given everything that's going on right now, it just it's going to require a little more time. And, and I think we've definitely tried to make that case. Um, but it is one of those issues where folks just have some folks have a difference of opinion, and it is one that generates, I think, very passionate and, and visceral responses, but um, I think we've definitely made uh, every effort to, to address those concerns and try and move forward. Anything else? Okay. Then I will um, move to a couple of bills that have generated um, a significant amount of discussion. Uh, the first is SB 850 by Senator Marty Block. Um, from the San Diego region, and this is legislation that would grant um, authority to the community colleges to offer the baccalaureate degree. It's currently constructed as a pilot program that would run for eight years, uh, and it is a pilot that would be limited to 15 colleges um, and no more than one campus within a district that has multiple colleges and no more than one baccalaureate degree program, and no baccalaureate degree programs that are duplicative of a program that's offered by either the University of California or the California State University system. So this is really a very narrow and targeted effort at looking at what are the, what are the uh, baccalaureate degree programs that are more uh, vocational and workforce oriented because part of what's um, in this bill is the idea that regionally around the state you need to uh, take a look at what's your regional economy looking like and to what extent are systems of public higher education meeting those those needs and and really creating the job force of the future and then if there is a disconnect between what the economy is requiring and what the educational institutions are providing how do we bridge that gap? One way would be for the community colleges to step in in a very limited fashion for a period of time and try and address that. I think um, there are programs around um, engineering technology, automotive technology that are not offered by the California State University system. And as we're seeing those, uh, those industries and those professions requiring higher levels of education and certification to enter that the baccalaureate degree uh, could, could be a very good option. I also think that there is an issue of access for some communities around the state that, for whatever reason, 
might not be able to go to a University of California or to a California State University or to a private institution. So this does provide a level of access. Um, again, I think this is, this is a significant step. There are many more steps that would need to follow should the bill be approved by the legislature and signed by the governor. One of the things that the Board of Governors would be charged with is one, approving any colleges that would be applying for the pilot program, and then two, looking at what is the appropriate fee structure, both on the side of students and what would students be charged, as well as what is the appropriate funding structure for the system to cover the cost of providing that upper division coursework. So um, you know, passage of SB 850 is by no means sort of the end of the path with, with this conversation and this, this discussion. I think it's something that's quite complicated, but um, there is a lot of support throughout our system. I think there's a, a fair amount of support within the legislature, and I think there's been a lot of discussion um, with the other segments, both the UC, the CSU, and certainly even coming out of the governor's office about being uh, more creative and innovative about how do we accelerate time to degree, how do we ensure that we're providing the graduates that are needed for our economy. So um, again, that bill is also in the Appropriations Committee, um, and it's on the suspense file, which is really where bills are parked, if you will, until there's some agreement that the state has the ability to fund those activities and there's a dedicated funding stream. The, um, the, the next bill that I'll mention that's gotten a lot of conversation uh, recently is uh, SB 173, and this deals with adult education. Uh, last year there was uh, language in the Budget Act that charged uh, the Chancellor's Office along with the California Department of Education to come together in a collaborative effort to look at adult education and really look at a different model of providing adult education, one that's built more regionally and one that's built through a consortium of, of uh, um, delivery that partners both uh, K-12 and the community colleges. That process has been ongoing. There's a working group comprised of both K-12 and community colleges. There's also a cabinet group that has the leadership from our office. Uh, Deputy Chancellor Skinner is on that group, as am I, and, and uh, Vice Chancellor Von Ton Quinlivan. Quinlivan. And then there are our counterparts at the Department of Education managing that effort. Um, originally, uh, before recent amendments to SB 173, that bill would have severely limited our ability to offer adult education, particularly those around adult learners, um, classes like parenting, classes for <coughs> older, adult, old, older adults, um, which in some communities are significant offerings. Uh, with the recent amendments, all of that language has been taken out of the bill. And what's been put in is language that really tracks with this AB 86 process. The idea is that we have this process in place. It's not yet complete. Let's hold off on legislation that would make any conclusions about how we would want to structure or fund adult education until we have the benefit of what comes out of that work between our office and the Department of Education. We're certainly extremely appreciative of Senator Carol Liu, who's the author of that bill. We've made the decision to, to really sort of hit the pause button and let us work through this other process. Um, so I'll take a quick pause there as well to see if you have questions about either the baccalaureate degree or the uh, adult ed uh, you know, legislation. It, it, it seems to me that um, the discussion on the baccalaureate degree began with something other than wanting to have the community colleges have offer or uh, give a baccalaureate degree. So we've kind of moved from a focus on a specific area of discipline, maybe nursing mm -hmm. being one of them, to one of simply having a piece of legislation that is saying uh, you're going to offer <coughs> a baccalaureate degree. Um, it seemed to me that at the beginning it wasn't really about changing the mission so much as to just address a need now we're in the process of maybe changing the mission and beginning to offer the baccalaureate degree in, in, a, in a more aggressive way. The transition, if you could explain how that occurred. Certainly. What so, did happen? So initially, nursing was the field that uh, I think was the focus and emphasis of this legislation. 
Uh, and part of that was a concern in some areas of the state, um, and I think with the industry itself, is that as the baccalaureate degree in nursing became, uh, or is moving toward the minimum qualification for entering that field, um, mm -hmm. what does that do to the um, associate degree of nursing that's offered to community colleges, and that does that potentially render it obsolete? Um, which gets into a lot of questions about um, not only the impacts to our system of that, but also if the baccalaureate degree uh, in nursing is the minimum qualification, to what extent does that create an access barrier? There was a lot of conversation around nursing, um, both uh, with, with the, the uh, professionals in the field as well as the other segments. And I think the, the conclusion was rather than uh, pressing that issue, given the resistance that we would take nursing, if you will, off the table through this language of non-duplication and really look at what is the value of having community colleges offer baccalaureate degrees, period. And I think build a case, if you will, is that successful through a limited pilot. And I think at the end of eight years, we'll be able to see and there is an evaluation component of this bill where the Department of Finance and the Legislative Analyst Office would come back and report on what we've done to see is this a model that's in the interest of the state. You know, I don't think it's unlike what occurred about a decade ago where the CSU received independent authority to offer the uh, education doctorate. And previously the, C the CSU was only allowed to offer those, those degrees in partnership with the UC system. And their case at the time was that that was a limiting factor, the partnerships weren't growing, that there was an access issue, and over a period of years they made the case that they should be able to offer those degrees independently. Um, and I think that's what we're talking about here in the case of nursing, sure. that we're trying to assess to what degree are we meeting the needs of the state. And I think, you know, hopefully we will see this out of the pilot. I also think this directly relates to the conversation that's happening now around the master plan. And, and that's not to suggest that the master plan hasn't served our state well and isn't the model and, and, and envy of many uh, nations around, around the world. But it was a document that was created in 1960. A tremendous amount of ch has changed in California. And to what extent do we need to have a conversation about is that document still um, serving us the way we need it to, given the demographic changes in the state, given the changes of our economy, um, so I think this sort of falls in that category of yeah. conversation about, you know, is the, the differentiation of mission that was envisioned in 1960, mm -hmm. does it still make sense now mm -hmm. um, given our population and given the needs of our workforce? Sure. Just to follow up, the, the uh, CSU target, their goal was to, uh, to offer the EDD in education, not necessarily to begin to offer doctoral pro uh, degree programs. Um, Ours is right now seemingly a little bit mixed. So ultimately is the goal to get targeted bachelor's degrees or is it simply to, as, as you were leading to there with the master plan, have the uh, community colleges add additional mission? Right. I don't know that it's to add an additional mission necessarily. I think it's to look at where are their specific disciplines and a lot of these I think are in the uh, more of the workforce oriented disciplines and where the associate's degree really isn't enough for you to excel in that discipline or in that profession. And, and, I, and I recognize and that, that. But again, you know, with the, the CSU UC experience, it was very targeted and very clear. Right now it's a little bit unclear. Right. And, 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 and certainly so because of the legislation evolving from what the original intent was in a very short period of time. Right. And, and quite honestly, I think. Um, you know, there was a lot of conversation about that. I think ultimately Senator Block d decided that even with the limitation, this was an issue that was important enough to him to move forward. Uh, and I think a lot of this will have to be decided by the individual colleges. You know, what is their capacity to do this? Recognizing that we have gone through a process through the Student Success Task Force of really focusing and narrowing um, our activities and looking at what's, you know, what's in the interest of our system and in the state. I don't think this is necessarily disconnected from that, but where you have certain regions that have an unmet need, what's the best way to address that need? Sure. And in eight years, I mean, I, who knows what may come of the evaluation of the, uh, um, of the uh, 
pilot and 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 certainly not speaking for the CSU but it's been you know, communicated to me that you know their feeling is well we just put greater investment in the CSU system and that will provide the baccalaureate degrees that are needed mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know if that's the answer or not and I think what Senator Block is saying with this is right. this is one option let's explore it it's a bit innovative You've got 22 other states, I think it's 22 around the country, where community colleges offer baccalaureate degrees. Um, and it seems to be working in those areas, and maybe it's, a, it's something that California ought to consider as well. Okay, Member Lansky. Just another comment on the pilot. I mean, if you go into this for eight years, it wouldn't be likely that you would then be able to tell a college to discontinue the program, you know. <laughs> So while it's a pilot, I, the effect would have to be early on that whatever programs got picked, students are suddenly not as interested as they had anticipated. I have a question, though, on the adult education. Uh, I'm just curious, because I've never heard the discussion, what impact would this have on, like, City College of San Francisco, which for years has always offered all the adult ed uh, in the area, or even in the San Diego Community College District, where in large part adult ed is offered by the community college district. Will this have any impact on those kinds of setups? Uh, to the extent that the bill is now requiring that, that there's a report back to the legislature on what's happening with adult education, um, what are the types, for instance, of non-credit courses that are being offered, how many, who's being served, um, and really looking at this consortium model that's, that's being rolled out, if you will, through this AB 86 process and reporting back on what's happening there. Um, the bill would also require uh, um, a look at an appropriate accountability system for adult education, what are the appropriate assessments and other tools to ensure that it's successful. So I think it's a step in how do we identify those elements that create a more successful adult education program, not necessarily saying what's happening in San Francisco or in other areas of the state need to be discontinued, but it is really how do those move forward in a more effective way. But they would have to provide some kind of report, those two as examples. Right, and that would be a report across the board. It's not limited to any particular right. college okay. or district. But they would be included. Yeah. Any other? Terrific. Um, the last three bills I wanted to highlight are uh, bills that deal with the accreditation process, uh, and this is really uh, a reaction to some extent uh, with the conversation and the situation and what's been happening here in Sacramento around City College of, uh, of San Francisco. The first is uh, AB 1942 by Assemblymember Bonta, um, and again, all three of these bills have been significantly amended to where now uh, AB 1942 is uh, requiring or asking that the Board of Governors create a task force to determine that if a college that meets the minimum conditions but is, is not accredited, to what extent could that college continue to re receive uh, state funding. Um, there would also be a requirement where uh, the Chancellor's Office would make recommendations to the legislature on the conditions under which colleges could receive continued funding, um, looking at what are the other options perhaps for accrediting within the state. Um, previously, these bills I think were much more problematic in terms of what they were proposing to do around accreditation and, and I think this is definitely a step back and you know we're looking at the language now to see to what extent um, is it more palatable for us and then to what extent does that uh, influence and change um, a position which we, we would bring back to you or depending on the timing might need to have the Chancellor take action and then report back to the board. Um, so that's, that's one of the bills. Um, the other is uh, uh, that I want to highlight is AB 2087 and this is by Assemblymember Tom Amiano who represents the uh, San Francisco uh, area. Originally, this bill was um, to remove the authority of the Board of Governors to appoint a special trustee. Uh, it's now been changed to where uh, the, um, the Board of Governors would need to amend its regulation to really lay out more clearly what is the process by which um, control and authority would be transitioned back from a special trustee to a local governing board. 
as well as what's the, the process, if you will, to have meaningful consultation with the local community. Um, you know, again, a significant improvement over what the bill was before. I, I think this is one that we need to look at very closely because, you know, the appointment of a special trustee is a very rare occurrence. And I think each situation has been uh, dramatically different. So I don't know that you can create sort of a, uh, a one-size-fits-all through regulation about how you step through this process. That's not to say that additional clarification and transparency isn't a good thing, but I think it's sort of how do you get there. Um, so this bill is, is continuing to move through the assembly. My sense is it will certainly move to, to the Senate, and we will be working with the author and, and the sponsors on this bill to see if there's ways in which we might uh, <coughs> might offer up uh, offer up some improvements, at least offer up improvements in, in, in our estimation. Um, the final bill that I'll touch upon with respect to uh, accreditation is a Senate Bill 1068, and this is by Senator uh, Jim Bell from the Santa Clara, Air Santa Clara area. And this would um, require the Board of Governors to really look at uh, analyzing the possibility of creating an independent accrediting body uh, in this state and look at other options of accreditation beyond what we have now um, and to what extent might um, the, co the community colleges be better served by a single accrediting agency in the state. Um, I think as it was mentioned previously, uh, we have uh, two accrediting agencies in California, one for community colleges and one for four-year institutions. So again, I think an improvement over what we were seeing before in the bill uh, and now something that is really looking at uh, further study and providing additional information <coughs> about how we might go forward with the accrediting uh, issue generally. So I will uh, stop there uh, before getting into the federal issues, which are relatively brief, but I wanted to provide any opportunity for questions. So, terrific. Then I'll move into uh, the federal issues, which um, uh, are really quite brief. The, um, the first one that I'll mention is that uh, Ted Mitchell, was recently confirmed by the United States Senate as the Undersecretary of Education with the U.S. Department of Education. Um, uh, Ted is, uh, is uh, a Californian and somebody that you may all know. He was uh, Dean of the uh, School of Education at UCLA. He was President of Occident <coughs> Occidental College. He was also a member of the State Board of Education and was part of an organization called the New School Venture Fund. Um, we've certainly been in conversation with him uh, already and looking forward to having another Californian in that post. Uh, he seems to be uh, very much up to speed on our issues in public higher education generally. While most of his work recently was more on the K-12 side, um, I think uh, he is a, a, a great selection and uh, I think by his unanimous uh, confirmation, uh, I, I think that's uh, an impression that's shared by, by uh, a great number of folks. The, uh, the last and final item I'll mention on uh, the federal update is last week the um, Senate Education Pensions, I can never get this one right, the Senate Health, Labor, and Pensions Committee in the U.S. Senate uh, held a hearing um, to look at minority serving institutions and how are ways that those institutions can better serve students, what are some of the best practices that can be employed across the nation. Um, Eloy uh, Oakley, the President Superintendent of Long Beach Community College, was invited to speak uh, and work with our office in developing his testimony. So it was an opportunity for us to, one, highlight um, what we've been doing through the student success work in terms of helping students in the creation of educational plans, additional counseling, which are focused on students across the board, but not just you know, uh, students who are from underserved populations but also the benefit of some of the things around salary surfer uh, and a lot of the things that I think um, the community colleges here in California have been uh, um, complimented for in terms of being really leading the nation on some of the accountability and some of the really innovation around serving students better. Um, many of our colleges are uh, serving significant numbers of uh, Hispanic students, African American students, Asian Pacific Islanders. So they were also looking at ways in which some of the federal laws and requirements around uh, the benefits that flow from those programs can be better utilized. Um, 
So I think that was a, another good opportunity to highlight what's happening in California and highlight uh, what's happening uh, with, with uh, some of our colleges that are really leading the way. And certainly appreciative uh, to President Oakley for his comments there. And, uh, and so with that, I will conclude and take any other questions you might have. Yes, uh, Member Epstein. Yeah, you, your, uh, your report talks about the sexual assault on campuses initiative by the uh, president, and I was wondering what, what is the community college system doing around that? Well, uh, a good question, and that's not just the president. We've also received um, correspondence from members of Congress who are also interested in, in campus climate and as it relates to sexual assault. For our system, it's, it's a little bit different in comparison to, say, the CSU system or the UC system where they have a centralized office and they can adopt policies across the board that are implemented um, really as directives, if you will. I think we certainly have a similar ability in terms of identifying what we think ought to happen uh, with our colleges and with our districts. Then it is a matter of working with those uh, independent boards and the trustees to ensure that we can get as broad a coverage as we can to make sure that, you know, when you have these situations occurs, uh, occur, that victims are, are treated uh, appropriately and given the supports and the benefits that they need, that uh, anyone who is accused, that they're dealt with accordingly and there's an element of due process. So I think we're trying to really standardize as much as we can how those situations are dealt with. And I think not only across our system, but to standardize what's happening with both the UC and the CSU. And I, I think it's, it's certainly a very real issue, one of great concern. We've seen several um, articles in the press here recently about um, events that have happened on not necessarily community college campuses, but other campuses in the state. So it's not one that, uh, that we are taking lightly. So is there a policy that, that we're uh, proposing that all the, uh, the local college districts use, or is, is there a, is, has there been any you know, formal action taken by the, by the community colleges statewide? Uh, to, to my knowledge, we have not yet. I think this is uh, clearly a, an issue that's getting uh, a renewed uh, attention, and we'll, we'll, we'll be deliberating over it. It's, uh, yeah, I would, I would also add for the community colleges, it is a somewhat different issue than with UC or CSU because the predominance of the, we have so many of our campuses are commuter campuses. And so in terms of residence halls, in terms of uh, um, kind of uh, uh, dense student housing uh, situations, some of these environments where assaults are more likely to occur, they're less prevalent in our system. It does not mean this is an issue we, we don't, aren't engaged on and don't have a, an active role to play. But I think it's finding what, what, what that role is and what those policies are, are. It's a somewhat more complex policy issue for us to, to, to work on. And I, 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 uh, I, I do think, though, that the, the increased attention that's being paid on this is going to um, provide us with an opportunity to step forward and provide some, some guidance and policy. I, I don't know exactly what that is yet, though. Uh, I'm looking at Vice Chancellor Linda Michalowski. I don't know if you, do you have anything to add at this point on that? If you don't, that's fine too. We can bring it back. Uh, I don't have a lot to add. We have, uh, you know, some resources devoted to um, health services and mental health services, and so there's some overlap um, through that work with the, um, you know, with some of the campus uh, folks who are tuned in to the, um, to the national efforts. But, uh, uh, as Deputy Chancellor Skinner said, we um, it, it's not the same kind of issue for us as it is for residential campuses, and we are not deeply engaged in it at this time. I, I would have just one point to that. <clears throat> All institutions are required under the Federal Clery Act to report what's happening on their campuses in terms of sexual assaults and, th and these types of events. So there is at least a capturing of data. Um, and I know that there's some conversation about, you know, how um, comprehensive that data is, but I think it, it's at least a benchmark, and I think that will then drive, okay, what do we need to be doing in terms of not only dealing with the situation after it's occurred, but what are the um, issues we can do around prevention so that those numbers come down. But at a minimum, we're, we're required to report those numbers to the federal government. Member Belansky? I think another thing that is... Uh, folks to research on this would be to look at uh, 
the templates of the Community College League of California because we do know that 68 of the 72 districts make use of that method of policy and administrative procedure. And it would be helpful as a start to at least know what they put into place because they do have several law firms that work for them to do that. I mean, just to get some kind of basis and some kind of uh, awareness of what's been put out from them to the colleges at this point in time. It would be helpful to know. Member Summers? I just want to say, I know that uh, Glendale College and Pasadena City College, it's a little bit more on the veteran standpoint as far as with the MST, but they were giving some credit, you know, for students to go to, for the awareness on it and getting the community involvement with it, which I think is really important because that's on your campus and sometimes it's the unspoken, well, the more as they say you don't see it, but it's nice that they give the college credit or allow them to take the time to do it. So if you get your community involved with it, and that's something to look at because with a lot of the veterans coming back and a lot of the issues that they have, there's a lot of training that they have for that. And one, I think it was Pasadena City College offered it at the Y, and there was a huge group of people from all students, not just veterans, and, they, and the network and the awareness that the male veterans or just civilians, I hate to say the word civilians, but the male versus the female all went to these uh, classes that they had, this training, and it was unbelievable. And it was about sexual assault, not only MST, you know, but it was about the assault and they got credit, which I thought was great because they worked with the colleges for the students to go, which drove them more to learn more about the sexual assault and the prevalence that's out there with domestic violence. So it's just something as colleges to think about as your community, give some credit to some of these people and they may not want to go, but when they go, they'll be like, wow. Thank you. Before uh, you leave the table, uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, we have, uh, Three public comment cards. Yes. Vice, uh, President Bond. Our first comment is from Lynette Niaga. And she'll be followed by Brad Reynolds. Good morning. I'm Lynette Yaga, and I represent the California Teachers Association and also the Community College Association. And I wanted to let the board know that CTA has taken an opposed position to both the dual enrollment bills and the baccalaureate bill. And I wanted to explain on the dual enrollment bill why we have taken this position. In consultation, we had discussions about the research basis for, a, for the dual enrollment programs. And I did ask the Chancellor's Office for uh, the evidence that dual enrollment programs serve the function that they are meant to serve. And that is to um, give students a pathway from high school to community college. I was referred to a research study from Florida. So what I would ask and what I would suggest to the board is that you ask the Chancellor's Office to give you the evidence, actual research evidence, that the programs serve the function that they are intended to serve. Because we are changing the mission of the community college when we provide education to high school students, it takes funding, no matter what the funding, what the program look, looks like, it takes funding away from the student success initiative that we so strongly support because one of our real problems with the student success initiative is the lack of counselors. And so we need funding for counselors so that our students who are actually community college students, not high school students and not baccalaureate degree students, those students get the counseling they need, get on the right path as college students to finish quickly and have an effective program of study. So when we look at dual enrollment programs, the anecdotal evidence that I have from faculty is that they are not as successful as they are promoted to be. And I can just speak briefly that at my college, 
and this is completely anecdotal, but, uh, but I'm asking for, for research evidence to the contrary, the dual enrollment program was used mostly by homeschooled students whose parents did not have the knowledge to teach the classes that they needed to finish their high school diploma. Well, that would not be serving the function that the, it was intended by dual enrollment programs. So this is what I'm suggesting to the board. Please ask the chancellor's office to see that evidence that these dual enrollment programs justified the expenditure from the funds that community colleges are given. Thank you. Brad Reynolds followed by Kim Perry. Greetings, members of the board, members of the Chancellor's Office. My name is Brad Reynolds. I'm the Vice President of the Community College Association of the California Teachers Association. I'm also a Professor of History at College of the Canyons and an Adjunct Professor of History at California State University, Northridge, where I'm a member of the California Faculty Association. I'm up here today to make sure the Board of Governors knows that all of the major faculty groups in the state of California oppose 850. Uh, the California Teachers Association is on record as opposed to it, the Community College Association, the um, California Faculty uh, 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 Association of the CSU, and also uh, the California Teachers, uh, excuse me, the um, uh, AFT, American Federation of Teachers as well. The reason is, is not because we all think it's a bad bill. Um, the, the problem is the lack of specificity as to what's going to happen to faculty. Uh, we're concerned at the CSU level uh, about uh, CC people uh, teaching CSU four-year classes. The CCs are concerned uh, about what's going to happen to uh, space on the campus. There's nothing in the bill about who's going to fund this. Uh, what's going to happen to our classes that we're already offering. I, I sat here yesterday and heard discussion about how we need to restore classes that were cut and it's part of the whole student success. But what's going to happen if these colleges take on these pilot programs and as uh, 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 Mr. Volansky pointed out and, and I think the Chancellor said at one of our consultation meetings there's never been a pilot program in the state of California that hasn't become permanent. So we're very concerned about what's going to happen here without the adequate funding for facilities, teachers. Uh, that's our big concern. I did meet twice in the last couple of weeks with people in Block's office, expressed our concerns. We know there's been some changes to the bill. Again, there are many faculty who are uh, not philosophically opposed to the bill. Our concern is the lack of specificity regarding faculty rights, issues, concerns. Thank you. Last card is from Kim Perry. Yeah, I'm Kim Perry. I'm the superintendent president of Butte Glen Community College District, and I'm here representing the CEO board as Area 1 uh, representative. I wanted to speak to a couple of discussion items that occurred on the last item. First of all is SB 965. Uh, there was a question about the CEO support or lack thereof of that bill, and I'm here representing the board, and the board originally had approved a support if amended because at one point the, the special trustee requirement of that bill was uh, taken out and it's been put back in, um, not in those language, in that language, but in that spirit and so that board has supported um, that bill. The way that our mechanism works, it's a, I'm a representative body and so before I bring my vote to the table, I pull the, the, how many colleges, nine or ten colleges in my region or districts in order to get their sense for that. So I'm not voting for myself, I'm voting for the colleges in area one and that's true of all the representatives. So the, the CEO board is in support of 965 with a small caveat. That caveat is, not a caveat, but, but I already said it so that's, you know, I'll just go with that because I'm a little nervous for some reason. <laughs> I speak in front of a board on a monthly basis, so I'm not sure what that's all about. Uh, but in any event, uh, the caveat is that there have been other colleges in this state who have suffered severe declines in enrollment as a result of going on show cause or even probation. Uh, most notably in Area 1 uh, is College of the Redwoods, who if you follow the news is having to close their Fort Bragg campus and are entering a potential agreement with M an MOU for Mendocino to offer classes in that area. 
and that creates all sorts of intri uh, uh, intrigue relative to property taxes and all that kind of thing, and I don't, I'm not following that very carefully. Uh, the same thing happened to Cuesta College. Their enrollment declined, uh, particularly after being show cause in uh, College of Sequoias uh, as well. And so City College of San Francisco, again, is, is um, larger, much larger than those colleges, yet I think the closing of a Fort Bragg campus probably had the same negative impact on that community of learners as it would have in City College of San Francisco. So the caveat is that, um, and it was as mentioned in this meeting, uh, is that, that this would be a precedent for doing similar kinds of things for other colleges, particularly through accreditation kind of actions, to see a decline in enrollment that one year of stabilization as it currently is would not um, support them. So that was the discussion at, at our board. Uh, and it, it was my discussion point because I'm very familiar with going, what's going on in, on, the, on the North Coast. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, SB 850, and, and I echo some of the other comments. The CEO board is in support of S, uh, SB 850, and I think that's what the beauty of a pilot is, is you kind of f hopefully figure out all the ins and outs about faculty and facilities and rate of pay and educational levels, um, much as we did uh, years ago when tech prep became federal legislation and community college faculty had uh, under suspect our high school faculty being able to teach courses that would then uh, articulate to community college and particularly to four-year institutions. So the board is in favor of, of that bill as well. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit, I know a little bit something about sexual assault. You're, you're almost out of time. Oh, I, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, just, I should have said that. Yeah, I'm not timed at my board meeting, so I just sort of <laughs> keep But if, if you have a concluding thought, please share it. I do. I just wanted to say that relative to sexual assault and Title IX issues, you've seen Butte College in the news about that is the only community college in the nation on the list of 55. So we know a little something about that. And the fact that the state didn't take this seriously three years ago uh, when the Dear Colleague letter come out, came out uh, has put us in a position, I think, where we are uh, today where we're playing catch up. The league is playing catch up. Federal government is playing catch up, and I hope that the chancellor's office plays catch up as well. And on one final thought, we have a college connection program where high school students are on our campus, and one of them was just selected an AS, an associate student officer, at the age of 15. So thank you very much. Thanks uh, to all of you. Are there any uh, questions of uh, Vice Chancellor Stewart? Uh, anyone else? Uh, Vice Chancellor, thank you very much. President Baca, is there an opportunity to, to respond to? Uh, absolutely. Because please. some some of this, I, I with all due respect, I think is inaccurate. Um, so with respect to the comments from CTA around AB 1451, um, we first started talking about this legislation actually back in September. And we have our monthly consultation council meetings and walk through exactly what we were trying to achieve with this bill. And again, this is something that's entirely voluntary. Currently, we have roughly 45,000 students who are enrolled in concurrent enrollment out of 2.1 million in growing students that we're serving. With respect to the research, we did cite several reports. The main report is one that was done um, through the Community College Research Center out of Teachers College, funded by the James Irvine Foundation. It started in 2008, ran from 2008 to 2011. There were nine pilot sites in the state of California. And the emphasis of this particular research was looking at concurrent enrollment for students who are not typically characterized as high achieving. Um, so you're talking about students who were probably in the 2.0, 2.5 GPA, perhaps at risk of dropping out, if not immediately, but at some point down the road. And then these were designed around career technical education pathways in the context of concurrent enrollment. That study followed the students for three years. So they followed them for their junior, senior year, and then the first year of community college. What that study found was that in high school, the students had higher GPAs, and they, had, they compared them to a cohort, had higher levels of high school gradua graduation. They then matriculated in the, into the community colleges at a greater uh, level of success. Once in the community colleges, they accumulated more units. 
So certainly it is one study, but it was showing a trend that this is something that can be effective under certain circumstances. That study was shared with all of the members of the Consultation Council. In addition to that, the League, Community College League of California, their research division also created a two-page summary of several studies that have looked at concurrent enrollment around the country. Uh, one in particular was done by the University of Illinois. Similar conclusions to the Irvine study and the Community College Research Center study out of Columbia. So is it exhaustive? It's not. But I think we have some research. And, and one of the reasons we've uh, embraced the notion of having the Department of Finance and the Legislative Analyst Office look at this, this program and report back is that we need more research to tell us is this effective. It's not a silver bullet, but it is one additional element that I think can be useful and that, that was the premise on which we decided to move this forward. Um, so I, I would just put that out there. Um, with respect to the comments about SB 850 and the baccalaureate degree legislation, that's not legislation that the Board of Governors or the Chancellor's Office is sponsoring, but we are certainly supportive. In response to the, to the comment about the lack of specificity, particularly around how would this be funded, how would it be paid for? What are the specifics around an individual pilot? Rather than spelling that out in, in the legislation, we felt that we really needed to have the Board of Governors, at least on the funding and the fee aspect, to really dig into those issues. Those are highly technical and complicated issues. And I don't know that that's something you want to get into in, in legislative committees where you may not have the level of expertise that you would want nor would you likely have the time to really give those issues the attention <coughs> that they deserve. Um, I also think that, that with respect to the, the lack of specificity around what those programs might look like, any college that would apply, again, to this voluntary program would have to spell out, you know, what is their administrative structure uh, for managing this program? What are the resources that they have on their campus to support this? Um, you know, what is the, 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 the bandwidth, if you will, to take this on, and that is this something that you can do without detracting from the core mission of the community colleges? So it may not be to the level of specificity that some would like, but I think, and I don't want to speak for Senator Block, I think significant steps were taken to try and really say, you know, this is not just anyone showing up at our front door saying we want to do the baccalaureate degree, but it is saying you need to spell out a plan and then the Board of Governors who can take, I think, the time and the attention needed to look at the funding and the fee structure to see how we marry that and make it work. <coughs> so um, I, I realize that folks may disagree, but I did not want to leave you with the impression that one, there was no research basis to the concurrent enrollment proposal, or two, that there was no thought given to really um, providing more specificity and, and, and detail around how some of the mechanics of doing the baccalaureate degree would actually work. Um, but again, we argued very vigorously that that was a conversation better done in this venue rather than in the legislature. Thank you. Member Saw. Um, Vice Chancellor uh, Stewart, if you could share that, that Irvine Foundation study with her, you just send a link. Absolutely. That would really appreciate it. Absolutely. Vice Chancellor Stewart, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Um, I'd like to first thank uh, Deputy Chancellor Skinner for filling in this morning for uh, Chancellor Harris. As, uh, as those of you that heard yesterday know, he needed to be away from uh, the meeting, the first meeting in 25 years of one of his boards that he's missed out on. But uh, he had some uh, very important business to take care of this morning uh, uh, related to the system. Uh, so uh, we appreciate uh, Deputy Chancellor uh, Skinner filling in. Uh, the next item is uh, board reports, and for those of you that are new, this is an opportunity if, to have maybe a, a, a little bit more in terms of uh, uh, your, your background and, and so forth. Uh, uh, what we do here is um, just kind of provide an update of where we've been over the last couple of months. So uh, I'll begin with uh, Member Asumi. Well, thank you very much, President Baca, and my welcome to everybody, who, uh, all the new members on the board. It's uh, great to meet all of you, and uh, we're looking forward to working with all of you on the, our board. Um, uh, just a, a few quick things, uh, uh, what I've done in 
the period since our last board meeting. Um, uh, I was interviewed by KCBS uh, News Radio in San Francisco on uh, issues of higher education, especially with regard to the need for more bachelor's degrees uh, to be granted in the state of California, and uh, was able to uh, spend a lot of the time uh, pointing to our student success uh, initiative and also the uh, student success scorecard and you know, uh, pointed to a lot of the statistics that Patrick Perry mentioned in his presentation. So uh, it was a good way to get our word out to a very broad audience in the Bay Area. Um, I was also, uh, um, I also want to say that I, 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 was a mem I was very honored to be a member of the Classified Employees Committee and I want to thank uh, the chairmanship of Danny Hawkins uh, who has done a terrific job leading that committee and uh, you know, uh, great to serve under Danny and also it's great to have Tana Thomas, the founder of the award here and uh, you know, it's just a terrific opportunity to recognize the classified employees in this system who do a terrific job and it's very difficult to uh, uh, decide who gets that award because uh, there are so many great applicants. Um, the uh, member uh, Reed and I attended uh, the uh, March meeting of the Foundation for California Community Colleges and uh, which is, uh, uh, as you heard from uh, President uh, Mills, a uh, terrific organization, and uh, you know we're glad to be uh, the board's representatives on that uh, uh, bo uh, board of directors. And uh, finally, um, I, I w I'm on an advisory panel for the Bay Area Economic Council uh, that, uh, and they just issued a, um, a draft white paper on higher education, and uh, it was. Uh, the good thing about being on that advisory council is that I was able to see an initial draft and it was very weighted uh, to issues just dealing with CSU and UC and I was able to uh, give a lot of input about uh, the things that the community colleges are doing, uh, especially in areas uh, such as uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Von Tan Quinn Livens' uh, economic workforce development uh, and also what the, uh, the data that the system has come up with with regard to distance learning, and uh, all of that was in, uh, integrated into their report, uh, and uh, you know, and it's now going to go through uh, a finalization process. So, thank you. Thank you, Lance. Member Vanden. Yes, uh, I was privileged enough to attend the Student Senate's Region Five meeting earlier this month, and uh, got some insights from students regarding certain legislation, uh, particularly SB 850 and AB 1271. So uh, that was good to hear from the students in my region especially. And over the past couple months, I've been working uh, particularly hard with uh, the Vice Chancellor of um, Finance in my district along with a uh, district-wide committee to develop fiscal strategies for uh, Clovis Community College Center and their transition into um, the accreditation process and getting a college status. Uh, so we've developed fiscal strategies uh, in order to hire a uh, couple new faculty members, an uh, articulation officer, and a couple new counselors. So that's been an interesting process. Thank you. Welcome again. Member Hawkins. Thank you. I'd like to personally welcome all the new members of the board. It's been a pleasure to, to meet you. Arnaldo will get together and uh, break bread at some point, <laughs> but welcome. Uh, the uh, uh, Classified Employees Awards are near and dear to my heart, and I'd like to thank Lance for his participation. Uh, in this morning's conversation with some of the, dis uh, the district's representatives, <coughs> uh, the, the judging process was, was uh, brought up. And I just wanted to share with everybody that the judges don't see the, the, the applications in a pure form. They are uh, redacted and they're not, they're blind. So you don't know the gender, you don't know the name, you don't know the city. So it, it's by the content and the quality uh, that each person represents. So it really is as fair and equitable a process as we, we can make it. I'd like to thank Tana Thomas for coming in today and being here for the awards. Nice to see you. And with that, I wish everybody a safe trip home. Member Volansky. I'd like to take the opportunity just to highlight a couple of things. Um, we've received notification a couple of times from uh, Chancellor Harris in updates about the Pathways to Law School initiative mm -hmm. and how that's moving forward. 
and the fact that uh, it's getting a lot of attention from the State Bar of California Council on Access, Fairness, and Diversity. And I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank the General Counsel at the Peralta Community College District, Tui Nguyen, for her work and uh, effort in this process. And I'd also like to thank the articulation officers, since I like articulation officers, uh, at the College of Alameda, Sheila Lau, who was the one who had the experience and expertise of how to do the pathway and get uh, students from high school to college to the university and that there'd be an agreement in those partnerships of how to structure the curriculum and make it articulate. So I'd like to just thank the two of those people who work in my district and just give them public attention. I also want to thank the Chancellor for sending us this UC Preparing California for its future and really hope that we can find a way to work with this and really uh, support this because I think the concept of having more community college students get placed at a UC and they do, I have to be honest, my experience is students tend to apply to the UC first before the CSU unless it's some very special major. Uh, and I think that the concept that, you know, if students have done well for two years in a community college, they're probably going to do very well because that's what the research shows in a UC. Uh, I'd like to thank the Chancellor, even though he's not here, that he's taking care of other very needed business, but I'd like to thank him for having come to the State Academic Senate's Spring Plenary and to give a presentation. I think that's very helpful each time he's done that at various conferences, workshops, etc. I know that it's a lot of travel for him, but nevertheless, it's very helpful to build those bridges and pathways and discussion and dialogue. Uh, I had the privilege of attending the spring plenary. I will now uh, attend the Curriculum Institute in July. I want to say uh, goodbye to Fred Harris and say thank you to Fred Harris. <laughs> he will be very missed from my point of view. And another person who's not in the room, but maybe somebody can tell her that I said I will miss her too, is Myrna Huffman. Uh, the word is, is that she's retiring, and uh, Myrna has been just great, so I'd like to say thank you to her. And um, there's a, someone that maybe none of us, or very few of us in the room know, but I would just like to do a public comment and thank you to this particular person too for probably over 40 years of work as an articulation officer and probably one of the most experienced and knowledgeable articulation officers in California and that's Catherine Barth at CSU Chico. Uh, Catherine has made the decision to retire and I don't know what we're going to do with the lack of their experience unless somebody can, you know, get her to do some consulting from time to time. Okay. Well, I wasn't here at the last meeting, but um, I'll just maybe take this opportunity to thank all the board members and staff. This has been such an informative two days. Um, I, it is drinking from a fire hose, but I have really enjoyed it and I'm very honored to be a member of this board. Um, I'm very interested in learning more about the pathways to law school and the, the role that community colleges can play. I am one of those non-practicing lawyers who still thinks it's an important field for folks to consider. Um, I, one point I will mention that, that happened uh, professionally that's relevant to what we do here. Um, I was working on a project with the UC Berkeley Labor Center and the Career Pathways Project and, and actually uh, Vice Chancellor Von Tong Quinlevin was a member of our advisory committee. We recently released a report that we we're doing on behalf of the, of the California Public Utilities Commission and PG&E looking at how to take investor owned utility dollars that are being expended on energy efficiency and uh, alternative energy programs and better focus workforce education and training programs so that we get great outcomes in terms of energy savings but also create good career pathways for disadvantaged workers. So after working on this project for nine months, we were delighted to release it and one of our prime recommendations is to have the investor owned utilities work more closely in partnerships with institutions like the <coughs> California Community Colleges which have such an excellent track record in creating these career pathways. So I'm hopeful that those recommendations will be adopted by the Public Utilities Commission and that we'll have even closer relationships between the PUC and the investor-owned utilities and the community colleges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colonel Sumner. 
Well, it's like, it's an honor to be here, and this is a lot taken in, like fire, I'd call it death by fire, or firing squad, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it, when you get appointed to a board, all of a sudden people start coming out of the woodwork, I found out. And um, within my community with living in Glendale, I was very honored to have a recipient re receiving an award today. But I'm working closely with the Veterans Coalition, and that is with, for Tri-City, so it's like Burbank, Glendale, the foothills, we keep expanding it because we're trying to reach out to um, all the veterans, and that's tying in two large community colleges, which is Glendale College and Pasadena City College. And they have uh, two very strong veteran centers, especially Pasadena, which I just, you know, really believe it. Actually, I did go to school at PCC, took one class there, one class at Glendale when I was doing my nursing program. So sort of needs to need to go back sort of, you know, circle of life, going back to the colleges and to be a part of the veterans program there. But we are giving two uh, education scholarships, or we're going to call it assistance funds because we're not calling them scholarships because then they can only be used for school. But this is because we've identified the needs of, you know, whether it be therapy dogs, child care, which is huge, trouble focusing. So the coalition, we're going to do it on May 29th. We're actually going to give one female vet and one vet, so one Glendale College veteran's getting $1,000, and one PCC alumni is getting $1,000. So we're presenting that to them, and that's because of the Veterans Coalition, because of the community involvement with all of the non-governmental agencies and all nonprofits that are seeing the issues with the veterans coming back and how important it is to reach out, to do offer, especially with sexual assault, because we can't let that, you know, lay by the side because it's out there, unfortunately. So. There's so many resources that are out there, but it's getting, it's hard to get veterans to come. Sometimes don't, veterans don't want to identify their veterans. They're not broken. I like to look at them as warriors. A veteran is a warrior, and 1% of the you know, population is veterans. So, you know, I'm proud to be a part of that, to be part of actually presenting the scholarships with, with that. It, but something I just got a, came up at the Veterans Coalition that they said, you're going up to the Board of Governors, we want you to bring this up. I said, okay. It's AB Bill 2341. It has to do with um, pupils for military family. It's uh, AB 230, yeah, 2341 pupils. And it, what it, it's about is the verbiage is really about identifying for the younger youth, or actually the, the children, that they have um, identified with their military. But it says, it says active duty. Military veterans is active duty, guard, reserve, and a veteran. If you just say active duty, you take away from all of the other people that need resources because you'll have guard and reserve that are actually doing active duty, that are deployed, that move around a lot. So I understand the bill. So I actually will talk with her about how we can maybe get the verbiage changed from active duty to put it out there. So something for you to look at when you look at some of these bills. You, know, you can't see a veteran sometimes. And um, so this was sort of exciting to come here and say, well, we can try to just get that verbiage changed a little bit to make a difference. And we got a lot of veterans coming back in the community colleges, nursing programs. I mean, I graduated as a nurse, so I went to the community colleges, and I think they're the best for nursing programs. But <laughs> So I'm proud to be at the community college and be here. And thank you. And um, it's a little different coming from a nursing and a military background. But it's uh, a lot of politics like everywhere you go. But <laughs> you really just have to lurk within your means and your resources and your community involvement is really what's going to drive a lot of these programs. So, so that's it. Thank you very much. Great to have you with us. Mm -hmm. Dr. Malumet? Um, I just also wanted to welcome the new board members. Uh, very happy with the governor's pick. So thank you. Look forward to working with you. Um, the only thing I can report is in February I did participate with the lobbying back in Washington, okay. D.C., um, and I will be able to make more meetings in the future, so I look forward to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Member Berg. Yeah, I'll make a comment about City College of San Francisco. <clears throat> We're working diligently, really diligently, to try to get everything on track, and I believe that it will be. By the time the fall semester comes, everything's going to be on track. So I feel very confident that I can. And I haven't been able to say that in quite a long while. So I wish us all luck. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Member Epstein? Hi. Uh, first, I, I, uh, I'm really delighted to be here. I thank the governor's office for, uh, for appointing me. And, uh, and I really appreciate all the time everybody at the community college, both the board members and the staff, have spent uh, trying to help me get ready. I, uh, I met with, uh, with Vice Chancellor Stewart. I met with the chancellor. and. Really uh, trying to learn as much as I can because I didn't come in with a lot of experience. But 
Um, I have been, uh, I've created a list of all the 112 community colleges, and I've been slowly memorizing them all. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I hope to have that done by the next meeting. And you're going to have one more to <laughs> remember, too. Yeah. Remember all of them. Yeah, well, thank you once again to have me. Obviously, this is a, a big honor to be a part of the board. And, and so one of the things I've, I've been doing locally there in Pleasanton and the uh, Las Positas uh, Chabot Colleges, I've met with the Chancellor there, Chancellor Jackson, and also with uh, President uh, Russell to get more uh, versed in what's the struggles and challenges of the community colleges there locally. So that's one of the things I've been trying to, to do. And also, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be down in Los Angeles for personal matters, and I want to take the opportunity to meet with some of the community colleges there as well. And so I'm reaching out to uh, some of the community colleges representatives just to get more versed again in, in what's there and what I can do um, as being part of this board. Because ultimately, from my perspective, it's all about the students and what we can do for them. And, uh, and really try to make it uh, a better opportunity for them as, as well as be productive citizens for the state of California and, and really help us all as, as taxpayers and individuals of the state of California. So thank you. Thank you. Member Barrera? I wanted to say hello and welcome to all the new members. I'm glad that I was able to speak with a lot of you and hopefully I'll get the chance to say hi and get to know the other members I haven't spoken with yet. Um, at, be at the beginning of this month, I spent four days in L.A. with the SSCCC Spring J, and I was very privileged to speak to a lot of uh, students. It was their first time at the GA, and it was wonderful hearing their experiences, hearing what they were going to take back to their colleges. Um, I was very happy that I had the chance to uh, peek in on the Spectrum Caucus, which led to um, a 45-minute discussion of uh, safe spaces and how to create those on community colleges that kind of relax, relate directly to the sexual harassment issue. Um, I also had the chance to attend a Panetta lecture, which is hosted in my home city of Monterey. And I was also able to speak with a lot of community college students, uh, CSU students, and even high school students about you know their education plans and what they think about politics, You know what they plan to do you know, going into public policy, you know, what, what type of system they're going to be going into, you know, transfer and things like that. And then it was just a wonderful opportunity, and I hope I can do more things like that in the coming months. Thank you very much. Vice President Bond. I have a couple of things. First, I want to thank the governor's staff for bringing us such an excellent group of new board members. We're so grateful to have this table full again and with the caliber of folks that are joined this board. It's, it's really exciting for us. Um, I want to thank uh, and Jerry and Karen Gilmer for staffing the Board of Governors because our, our board administrator, uh, Clarissa Ranhell, has uh, had a baby girl. And uh, we wish Clarissa well. And we have a card from the entire board to her. And, but want to thank and Jerry for stepping in and, and, and taking care of, uh, good care of us this last couple of weeks. And lastly, it's just on a personal note, I, my daughter's a fourth grader, and she came to the Capitol uh, a week and a half ago, and uh, they had a wonderful experience. They visited the Capitol. Uh, I, they were looking for Sutter. Sutter wasn't around, but uh, <laughs> Nancy McFadden arranged for them to come visit the Horseshoe, and that was a, a, an important experience. And one of her classmates actually wrote a short poem that I want to share <laughs> uh, uh, his name's Will Fosselman, and he, he asked me to bring it. And he said, uh, hello, Governor Brown. I, wrote, I just wrote a little poem about when I got to visit your office. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. And the poem began, it's called Sacramento. Thank you so much for an awesome trip. I loved your painting. I never wanted to sit. I loved your city. Yes, I did. It was cool as a fridge. I liked your staff very much. They always looked so happy, and none were snappy. <laughs> <laughs> I love Sacramento. Yes, I did. It was so fun playing in the sun in your beautiful city. Thank you, Mr. Brown, so much. I loved your city very, very, very much. And that's <laughs> Will Fossil. And that's uh, the impression you're making on the new generation of, uh, of school kids. And I know you have them through the halls all the time, but I thought that was something that I wanted to share with the board and, and everybody else. That's my do we have a copy of that at the office? Uh, I, gave, I dropped one off yesterday with okay, Fowler. Great. So, yeah. Just want to make sure. Sure. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to Jerry for uh, <coughs> taking care of things in uh, mm -hmm. Clarissa's absence. Um, we do have a, pup, a couple of public uh, forum, uh, public comments. 
Uh, the first is Beth Smith. And following Beth is Dean Murakam. <coughs> Uh, uh, good morning. I'm Beth Smith. I'm the president of the Academic Senate, and Njiri is passing out a list of the resolutions that were passed at our spring plenary session, so just wanted to give you a sense of what occurred there. Uh, I'm not sure how much you know about the Academic Senate. We are the official representative of all the faculty in the state on all academic and professional matters. We are the folks responsible for making sure that there are faculty participants on consultation council and other governance councils in the task forces and committees in the state uh, working on academic and professional matters. So uh, this uh, list of resolutions kind of gives you a scope of the work that we've been doing. There's over 40 there. And uh, just briefly, they're on professional development, accreditation, curriculum, transfer, and some internal issues. You may notice that there's also a position there on the bachelor's degree. Uh, at this point, the Senate is not supporting or opposing SB 850. We are recommending <laughs> further study and investigation, feasibility, cost analysis, uh, to see what this really means for community colleges and our students and our faculty. Uh, Let's see, I wanted to also um, share that uh, the AB86 work is proceeding. That's the work on the non-credit and adult ed transition program, and we're very interested to see how that's going to work now that there will be, uh, well, there's proposed more funding through the governor's budget uh, for the CDCP, the uh, enhanced non-credit. Want to make sure that faculty are participating in that uh, because there is a greater opportunity now to affect curriculum if you're going to have that enhanced rate for the non-credit. Uh, we've had an artificial boundary uh, based on funding between credit and non-credit, and once that's equalized, you're going to see a lot more opportunity open up in terms of curricular options. So we need faculty on that at the very highest levels, making sure that we have participation. And both the unions and the Senate have brought that issue to the table of the 86 work group to uh, make sure we can have that voice heard. And this is my last board meeting. My term ends July, uh, July, June 30th. And so it's been a pleasure getting to work with everyone on the board and the new members that are here. You guys have walked into the best system on the planet. I wish you much uh, success around this table working for California's citizens and students. I thank the Chancellor's Office and all of the staff that I've had a chance to work with over the years. It's been great. And also the foundation. Uh, geez, working between all of you and seeing the partnerships that can develop and how much we can do together, it's really uh, remarkable. And I hope that all of that continues uh, for the best uh, for all of our students in the state. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Beth. Dean Murakami. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dean Murakami with the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges. And I want to welcome all the new board members here today. I, I want to hopefully we'll have a, a wonderful working relationship with everybody here. I, 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 I do apologize. I, I, I should have made these comments earlier, but uh, I do want to talk about, <coughs> just mention a couple of the faculty priorities concerning the budget. That if new revenues are available, if, if that does happen, I just want to give you a sense of where we'd like to see money spent. And besides COLA, which is also everybody agrees that we need more COLA, their purchasing power has declined by 16.3%. And uh, that's been, uh, it, it's not only uh, a, a difficult thing, not only for faculty salaries, but for running the college. COLA is absolutely critical uh, in general. Uh, also, uh, we do also have a need to somehow reverse the trend for full time faculty. Uh, hires. Uh, the 75-25 ratio now is about 56 percent is taught by full-timers and it's continuing to decline. I will say the number of uh, colleges that have that are in the 40 percent range of full-time faculty is uh, atrocious uh, but that trend is continuing and we need to have a dedicated stream of funding that will reverse this trend and hire more full-time faculty because they play such a critical role in governance and running of the colleges that without them it, it will make a, a 
uh, almost impossible to see really improvements of curriculum and programs and, and, uh, and for student success in counseling. Uh, the other one is to hire more full-time counselors. Uh, we have a, you know, uh, I think that the student to counselor ratio is atrocious. I think that we need to improve that tremendously, especially if we do have that focus on student success and meet the goals of the student success and support uh, program. I think that that's absolutely vital that more counselors are, are hired and to uh, address this specific ratio. Uh, we think that uh, we'd like to see more funding and full restoration of funding for EOPNS, DSPNS, and CalWORKS. Uh, you know, they serve our most vulnerable students. If you want to see uh, 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 the issue addressed concerning equity uh, and, and achievement gaps, I think that uh, those programs have been in place for a long time. They address our, our, our most vulnerable students. And if we're going to really be serious about making progress in, those, in that area of, of equity, then I think these programs need to be funded. It's, it's just curious to me that those programs continue to get cut while we're saying we, want, we need help in, in, in uh, closing the achievement gap. I just don't understand the logic here. I, I do uh, applaud that the, uh, in terms of the proposal to change the match for, the, uh, uh, for SSSP. Um, uh, that proposal is going to be vital because I think that as those funds continue to grow, it's going to be impossible for uh, colleges to, uh, or districts to make that match. It's going to be just absolutely impossible. It's difficult now. It is very difficult now. So I applaud the, the, the proposed changes on that. Um, also uh, concerning uh, the money going to deferred maintenance uh, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, excluding uh, instructional equipment, we think that that's the wrong direction to take. All of us uh, need a lot of, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're spending a lot of money on, on changing classrooms and instructional equipment and, and more services and technical services for our, our, in our colleges and classrooms. Uh, we think that making it flexible for deferred maintenance and and instructional equipment together, I think is a much better approach and let the, the local colleges and districts decide where to spend that money rather than excluding out instructional equipment. Do you have a concluding thought? And the last one, yeah. And the last one is uh, we do have a concern about the uh, STRS contribution, uh, contributions as well. Uh, we know that that has to get uh, addressed. Uh, uh, many of us would like to see potentially maybe the, the uh, deferrals being extended across the maybe several years, three years or so, so that money can be applied to, this, to, to the unfunded liability because uh, more money put in early means a lot less later on. And so because the compounding interest of that, of that debt is a, is a critical issue to, uh, to observe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. And thank you all for being here this morning. Jason, thank you for being here with us this morning again. And uh, we will see you uh, in July. Okay.